Many people don't realize this, but Australia is home to over 10,000 beaches spread across over 50,000 kilometers of coastline. Over 85% of Australians live by the beach. The beaches of Australia are prime tourist attractions. Gazing at the clear blue water, breathing in the fresh and salty air, and feeling the golden and warm sand beneath your feet sounds heavenly to most people. But for the Cordingley family, the beach isn't an emanation of serenity, freedom, and beauty. Rather, it's a horrific reminder of a crime that left them scarred with pain and despair forever. 24-year-old Toya Cordingley was minding her own business walking along the shore of the quaint and secluded Wanjetty Beach, approximately 38 miles away from her hometown of Cairns, with her dog Indy, on a sunny afternoon of October 21st, 2018. But afternoon turned to night, and Toya never returned home. Alarmed, her loved ones searched for Toya first thing the next morning, hoping that she was safe. But what they tragically found was Toya's lifeless body. Everyone in Cairns was plagued by horror and disbelief after Toya's ill-fated end. But questions were looming over everyone's head. Why was Toya attacked? Who was her attacker? And what led to such a horrible incident? The case of Toya Cordingly is shocking and downright depressing. And while Australia may be thousands of miles away for many of us, it's a case that hits too close to home for most. If you're watching this video, that means you're probably interested in true crime. And if you're interested in true crime, then I'd be willing to bet you'd be interested in this channel, True Crime Stories. So do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button below. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future cases. Toya Jade Cordingley was born on June 14, 1994, to parents Troy and Vanessa in Cairns, Queensland, along Australia's northeastern coast. She was the only child of her parents, and the family of three had a good life. But not for long. See, when Toya was still very young, her parents got divorced. Even though Toya's parents loved her to bits, their marriage wasn't working out. Troy went on to marry a woman named Mary, and Vanessa married a man named Darren Gardner. And they went on to have two more children, Jack and Lena. Even though divorces can have a significant impact on the child involved, Toya didn't seem to mind. If anything, she was excited to be a part of two families. So she was adjusting really well to her family's new dynamic. She even had a great relationship with her step-siblings, and everyone loved the vibrant and cheerful Toya. Family and friends defined Toya as carefree and adventurous. She had a warm and loving personality, and she was the person who said yes to new adventures. Toya loved fairies and anything mystic, and she was very outgoing with her style, especially her hair and her clothes. Toya changed her hair frequently. Sometimes she would have bright pink hair, other times it would be purple and sometimes fire engine red. In October of 2018, though, Toya was sporting an icy blonde hair color. Toya's parents were no different either. They were unapologetically expressive with their styles. Sleeves of tattoos, funky hairstyles, and an alternative approach to life were things that were normal for the Cordingly Gardner family. All in all, Toya and her family weren't afraid to freely express their style. Toya also adored animals, so much so that she took up a job as a kennel attendant at a Paws and Claws refuge and boarding center in Port Douglas. Her love for animals can also be seen in her last social media post, which was in October of 2018, reading, quote, no matter how talented, rich, or intelligent you are, how you treat animals tells me all I need to know about you. And I couldn't agree more. Paws and Claws counselor Michael Kerr defined Toya as a beautiful, loving soul and a loyal employee. According to Michael, Toya could calm down the most aggressive of dogs within minutes, and that was just a gifted quality of hers. Not long after, Toya did start a new job, working in a pharmacy called Whole Life in Earlville, a suburb of Cairns. But her heart was still with animals, so she continuously volunteered with animals and even kept lots of pets. Toya was also in a two-year-long relationship with a guy named Marco, and the two bonded over their love for animals, especially dogs. Marco and Toya also had the same goals in life, and the two were head over heels for each other. Toya's family was over the moon for her, as she would finally with a guy who made her genuinely happy. The couple also had a dog, a German Shepherd Mastiff and Great Dane mix named Indy, who was essentially a gentle giant. Toya and Marco moved in together with their pets, and life was perfect for them. But this would all change in the most heartbreaking way, on October 21st, 2018. 
the Cordingley family would be struck with something so unexpected and so tragic. Sunday, October 21st, 2018, started out just like any other day for Toya. She had some errands planned, and one of them was to take her dog Indy out for a walk on one jetty beach, about 38 kilometers north of Cairns, roughly halfway between it and Port Douglas. She worked her shift at Whole Life Pharmacy, handing out camel milk samples to customers. And yes, you heard that correctly, camel milk. You learn something new every day, I guess. Anyway, after work, Toya made her way to Rusty's Market, which was close to the waterfront, to pick up some produce for dinner that night. And she was actually seen on CCTV footage between 12 and 1 p.m. carrying a colorful basket donned in a light blue crochet top with her hair up. After her trip to Rusty's Market, Toya returned home and informed Marco about her trip to the beach with Indy. She left the house at about 2.30 p.m. with Indy and made her way to Wanjetti Beach in her 2009 blue Mitsubishi Lancer. She parked it near the southern entrance of the beach, and then it's assumed that she went for a walk on the beach with Indy. Wanjetti Beach is a remote shoreline, with four kilometers of coastline and no facilities apart from a parking lot and the highway. The beach is known as a local secret, and it's very quaint. But Toya would never make it back home for dinner. When hours passed and afternoon darkened into evening, Marco started to worry about Toya, as she wasn't answering her phone and wasn't home yet. At 9 p.m., Marco called Jack, Toya's stepbrother, and asked if she was there with him, as she still hadn't returned home for a very long time. Jack was also immediately alarmed, as Toya hadn't come to visit him, and he went straight to his mom, Vanessa's room, who was getting ready for bed at that time. As soon as she heard the knock and saw her son's visibly nervous and shaken demeanor, Vanessa felt in her gut that something was wrong. Jack went on to tell Vanessa that Toya was gone since that afternoon, and no one could reach her. The police were immediately contacted, and 24-year-old Toya was officially reported missing at 10.50 p.m. Vanessa even called Troy, her ex-husband and Toya's dad, and together, along with friends and family, they started looking for Toya in their neighborhood and even spread word across social media. The police suggested that they look for Toya in the morning because Wanjetti Beach was essentially a pitch-black pit of sand and water at that time, and with the high tide, it was impossible to find anything, and it could have even been dangerous for searchers. While the police's suggestion was reasonable, Toya's family was eager to start their search as they wanted to find her immediately, no matter what time of day it was. But without having any luck during the evening, the investigators and Toya's family eventually agreed to look for her first thing in the morning. The 22nd of October rolled around, and early in the morning, Toya's family, armed with flashlights, went to Wanjetti Beach where they found something. Something that bloomed hope in their fearful hearts. It was Toya's car. It was still parked there, but there was no sign of Toya. But the family was relieved at that moment because it meant that Toya hadn't left the beach and gone somewhere else. When the group made it to the shore, the tide was still high, although there was still no sign of Toya. But Vanessa did find something, or someone. Vanessa's eye wandered towards a bush, and she felt as though something was moving behind it. When she made her way towards it, she saw Indy, Toya's pet dog, tied to a tree so tightly that it was unable to sit down. This clearly wasn't done by Toya. She was a die-hard animal lover and put her pet's comfort before anything else, so it would have been impossible for Toya to tie Indy's leash so unbearably tight. Troy and Vanessa freed Indy by cutting the leash, and Vanessa made her way to the car to charge her phone, since it had now run out of battery. This was probably a divine sign, because as the sun started to rise and the tide began to wash away, Troy made a horrendous discovery that no mother or father should ever have to witness. See, when the tide slowly retreated, Troy noticed something poking out of the sand. As he approached closer, his mind registered what he was looking at. It was a human foot. About 800 meters away from where Toya parked her car at 7.45 a.m., her body was tragically discovered by none other than her father, buried in a shallow grave. The sight of his only child in such a terrifying state is forever burned into Troy's mind. Toya was disrobed and had sustained violent injuries, possibly from a knife. Vanessa was informed of her daughter's discovery and tragic passing by Jack, her brother, and she was struck with shock and disbelief and then unadulterated horror and grief. Her 24-year-old, life-loving daughter had been taken away from her in such a tragic way, and she couldn't do anything but cry. Vanessa, because of how grave Toya's injuries were, wasn't even allowed to see her daughter as she was being taken away from the beach. 
It's so harrowing for a parent to go through this. Troy and Vanessa knew that their lives would never be the same again. The Queensland detectives also had some things to worry about, and primarily it was who attacked Toya? And was it someone that she knew, or was it a random attack? The city of Cairns was shocked by Toya's unfortunate passing, as she didn't have any enemies and was the kindest, gentlest person anyone knew. And they were scared that the perpetrator was still out there, and no one knew who they were. Even though Wanjetti Beach was a beautiful place to visit, it wasn't the safest place for women. This sandy beach had an uncomfortable history that made it unsafe. See, there were multiple occasions when girls and even young women, including Toya's best friend Megan, had gone to the beach for a fun getaway when they saw random men peering out of the bushes watching them. Some of the incidents were downright indecent and uncomfortable for the girls because men would disrobe and perform inappropriate acts right there in front of them. This string of incidents left girls and women with no choice but to flee the scene in obvious discomfort and fear. Since it was a remote place surrounded by bushes, shrubs, and a highway, Wanjetti Beach became a hotspot for predators and vile people. To be at this beach in the presence of friends was bad enough, but when you consider that Toya had been completely alone that day, aside from her dog, well, the story speaks for itself. So the question was, is this what happened to Toya? Did one of these predators manage to grab her and do the unthinkable? Amidst the investigators trying to uncover clues that could lead to answers for the grieving Cordingley family, Toya's funeral was held on November 2nd, 2018, and hundreds of people flocked to say their final goodbyes to a bright young woman whose life was tragically and unexpectedly cut short. What was so heartbreaking was that Marco, Toya's boyfriend, attended the funeral with Indy, who was with Toya on the day that she was tragically attacked. I know a lot of people joke about what if dogs were able to talk, but in all seriousness, if there were ever a time for a dog to be able to speak up, it would be right now. Indy likely saw the entire attack from beginning to end, and those memories are simply etched into that dog's mind, never to be released. At the end of the funeral, Toya was laid to rest with freshly picked flowers, surrounded by the people that she impacted so deeply. Meanwhile, the investigators taped off the beach and divers and canine units were called to find any traces of another person that could be Toya's killer. DNA testing, surveillance footage, forensics, witness reports, everything was checked by police. They even checked cell tower activity on the day and time that Toya was at the beach. The detectives also had obvious suspects at the time of the crime, including Toya's boyfriend Marco and her stepdad, Darren but they were both soon ruled out because not only did they have airtight alibis, but it didn't make much sense as to why any of them would want to hurt Toya. Moreover, there was another very confusing part about this whole case, and that was the question, why was Indy unharmed? Usually when an evil person commits heinous crimes, they unfortunately don't leave pets unscathed. But to investigators, Indy's survival meant that the perpetrator was possibly someone Toya and Indy both knew which could explain why the dog didn't attack when Toya was nabbed by her assailant. But it was soon found out that Indy was an obedient dog by nature. And even though his size would make people run for the hills, Indy was affectionate towards even strangers. So the idea of Indy being willing to tear down Toya's attacker, well, it seems fairly unlikely. Anyway, the investigation was massive. It even included alternative and voluntary DNA testing of residents living near the crime scene so that investigators could shrink their suspect list down. Investigators also looked at cars driving down Captain Cook Highway. And finally, after six months of combing through all the footage and cell tower details, the investigators had a suspect. They found him based on dash cam footage, geolocation, and a bizarre car that was seen swerving down the highway that overlooked the beach on the same day Toya went missing. When police ran the plates, they came across two very shocking things. First, the car wasn't registered to the area where it was seen, so it could have been someone who was simply visiting Wanjetti Beach. But the second detail was more alarming, and it was that the person who owned the car left Australia on the day of Toya's disappearance, taking a flight to India. This was alarming for investigators because now catching the perpetrator was going to take a cross-continent effort. But who was the man and what was his connection to Toya? As police honed in on their primary suspect, they revealed that he was a 34-year-old Indian man named Rajwinder Singh. 
He made the move from India to Queensland years ago and was currently working as a geriatric nurse in a hospital about 90 kilometers south of Cairns. When the detectives visited the hospital where Rajwinder worked, co-workers remembered him acting weird and closed off a couple of weeks before the 21st of October. Rajwinder was apparently suffering from depression and chose to stay in his own company for the most part. He never really got out much and didn't associate with his co-workers outside of work. But this didn't sound alarming at first. Sometimes people just prefer to keep to themselves. But the police made their next stop, which was none other than Rajwinder's home. Unsurprisingly, they didn't find him there, but rather his wife and three children, one of them being a newborn. According to Rajwinder's wife, he left Queensland coincidentally on the 21st of October, heading for Sydney. There, he stayed with his sister for the night before catching the flight to India. Rashwinder's movements and hasty actions further solidified the investigator's suspicions. But there was more. When police talked to the witnesses, they stated that Rashwinder's face, neck, and even his hands were littered with scratches and bite marks, which is very concerning. Australian investigators knew that they had to work together with Indian law enforcement to track down Rashwinder and extradite him back to Australia to face the law. Because these wounds he'd sustained had almost certainly come from Toya. At least this was the theory detectives were operating under at the time. But it wasn't going to be easy to track this man down, and from that point onwards, a long and brutal waiting game began for Toya's family, which was frustrating but inevitable. Extradition processes can take a lot of time to reach completion, because you're talking about two countries coming to the same page regarding the presented evidence to catch a criminal. It can essentially be a court case in and of itself, and we all know how many years court cases can take to reach a conclusion. Even though Australian police knew that Rajwinder was in India, after confirming with Indian detectives, things weren't going to be smooth sailing. The Australian government wanted to present rock-solid evidence against Rajwinder, which they had in the form of DNA found at the crime scene, and they didn't want to scare Rajwinder away because he seemed to have a tendency to flee when things didn't go his way. The process of making a brief of extradition took Australian law enforcement almost two and a half years. All the while, Toya's family was growing impatient by the slowness of the law, as they wanted justice to be served for their innocent daughter, who unknowingly and possibly became a victim of Rajwinder. But as the brief was sent in, nothing was really done. Indian investigators still needed to find Rajwinder, which was easier said than done. The local authorities in Australia even offered up a massive $1 million reward for information leading to Rajwinder's arrest. Thankfully, the promise of money worked, and less than a month later, a significant tip came in that would lead police right to Rajwinder. According to the person who gave the tip, Rajwinder was now part of a religious group. He wore a turban, had grown a long beard, and had lost a lot of weight, too. Essentially, from what we can gather, Rajwinder was trying to blend in with the crowd, which is so infuriating to know that he knew good and well that he was a wanted man. Moreover, the person also gave detectives a crucial piece of information that would ultimately lead to them catching and arresting Rajwinder. See, he was about to visit New Delhi in a couple of days for a doctor's appointment, and the detectives knew that this was their only chance. Finally, on November 25th, 2022, Four years after Toya's disappearance and subsequent passing, 38-year-old Rajwinder Singh was arrested in New Delhi and held in a jail cell awaiting extradition. Surprisingly, he soon confessed to the crime in front of an Indian court. When asked about the motive, the answer he gave was vague yet terrifying. According to Rajwinder, on the 21st of October, he apparently got into a heated argument with his wife and left for Cairns to cool down. He oddly had a kitchen knife with him at that time, and once he reached Wanjetty Beach, he sat on the sand, cut up some fruit, and was enjoying some peace and quiet. This was when he heard a dog barking at him. This was, sadly, Indy, who was with Toya. The incessant barking angered Rajwinder to no end, and he started yet another argument, but this time with Toya. During the argument, Rajwinder, in a rageful haze, pulled out the kitchen knife and launched a vicious and frenzied attack on Toya. It's speculated from the injuries that he sustained that Toya fought for her life, but Rajwinder overpowered her and tragically, Toya lost her life in the end. What was so harrowing was that the only witness to this horrific scene were Toya, Rajwinder, and Indy, whom Rajwinder tied to a tree after burying Toya's body in a shallow grave and then fled the scene. It's so unbelievable that Toya lost her life at the hands of a man that she didn't even know. She was simply walking on the beach with her beloved dog when she crossed paths with an unstable Rajwinder, 
who mercilessly attacked and ended her life over such a minor issue, which I don't even know if you can call it that. It's just a dog doing what dogs do, bark. It's essentially normal behavior. Toya lost her life for literally no reason at all. On January 24th, 2023, the Delhi court approved the extradition of Rajinder Singh on February 28th, and he flew from Delhi airport to Melbourne airport to face prosecution for ending the life of 24-year-old Toy accordingly. He was eventually charged with murder in March of 2023, and you would think that would finally be the end of it. But Rajinder's defense was nowhere near done. May 1st of 2024, a pretrial hearing was held which opened a whole new can of worms. See, the court was presented with evidence that Toya was in a secret relationship with a man named Tyson Franklin, a podiatrist, whom she met a few weeks before her passing. A series of text messages between Tyson and Toya were also presented by the defense in court. In the messages, Toya confided in Tyson about how Marco was, quote, angry at the world, and that those emotions had been projected onto her. Tyson even appeared in front of the court and stated that he and Toya had chemistry. Tyson also confessed that he was in contact with Toya via text until her passing, and that Toya told him that she was considering moving to a new place by herself. Shockingly, Tyson was questioned by the investigators at the time of Toya's disappearance, although he conveniently left out the part about him and Toya secretly seeing each other. But he confessed to them being involved with one another in court during a cross-examination. Now, it's unclear whether Toya was actually seeing someone else besides Marco, her boyfriend of two years, or if this was just a ploy by the defense to deter the actual course of the case. While Tyson and Toya certainly were friendly with one another, I wasn't able to find any concrete proof that the two were romantically involved. The reason I tend to believe that they weren't is because Toya's plans for the future. For example, moving out on her own. She didn't seem to include Tyson in this. She strictly said that she wanted to get away from Marco for a while and nothing else. Regardless, this revelation has brought about some new opinions on Toya's case. The vast majority of people still believe that Rajminder Singh is responsible for Toya's death, as his fleeing the country following Toya's demise was very dodgy considering that his wife just gave birth to a newborn child. He'd sustained mysterious injuries, his car was seen at the area at the time Toya disappeared, and he also confessed to the crime, although he later recanted this confession. On top of that, he even tried to change his appearance to blend in with the crowd, all of which is highly suspicious. But there's another opinion of some people that Rajminder Singh wasn't the one to attack Toya. Rather, it was someone close to her. This opinion points fingers at either Marco or Tyson. Some believe it's possible that Marco took Toya's life because he found out about Tyson. But again, there's no evidence to suggest that Toya and Tyson were romantically involved. Also, Marco was cleared as a suspect very early on, and Tyson didn't seem to have any ill will towards Toya whatsoever. So Tyson can't be put at the crime scene either. There are so many unknowns in this case, and unfortunately we'll have to wait for the trial to find out how all of this really unfolds. Speaking of the trial, as of the most recent updates, Rajminder's trial for Toya's murder has been delayed to February of 2024, after his attorney, Angus Edwards, applied for an adjournment at the pre-trial hearing held on July 19th of 2024. The reason for the adjournment was that the defense team needed time to go through heaps of evidence to properly represent Rajminder and his involvement in Toya's passing. The Cordingley family is finally at the point where they feel like justice will be served for Toya. After spending six long years waiting for updates on Toya's case, the painstakingly lengthy extradition process, and the eventual extradition of Rajwinder, well, it's taken a toll on the Cordingley family. They've lost faith in the Australian justice system, all the while facing harsh criticism from the people around them. Toya's mom, Vanessa, expressed her sadness at a certain group of people in the community who brutally judged the family and their so-called alternative lifestyle. It's just so heartbreaking that an already bereaved family is being constantly bombarded with such cruel words just for being themselves. I'm telling you, across the globe, we seem to live in a culture that constantly preaches about equality and inclusion. We keep seeing all these different movements and hearing all these statements from people who are constantly preaching about equality. But let's be painfully honest. People only want equality for those whose lifestyles align with their own. That's the God's honest truth. The fact that people are badgering Toya's family just because they're a little unusual, shame on you. 
The case of Toy Accordingly may be well on its way to closure, but it's not there yet. And this is what makes everything so unfulfilling and disheartening. Toya was a young and vibrant woman who had her whole life ahead of her, but everything she had planned for her future crumbled and she never got to live her life to the fullest. Toya's family is not even close to moving on with their lives. With Rajwinder's trial due in February of 2025, the Cordingley family is counting down the days until they can finally move on to the road of healing from this irrevocable loss. If Rajwinder is the person who snuffed the life out of this innocent and unsuspecting young woman, and this is so frightening. To think that you can randomly cross paths with someone so volatile and unstable is just beyond eerie. This case is a shining example that danger can be found literally anywhere. Broken, disturbed people are walking among us, and we probably pass by multiple people like Rajinder Singh every single day without knowing it. We can only hope that the trial can hold answers for the Kodingli family, as well as the closure that they need to finally move on with their lives after experiencing such a perpetual nightmare. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to some of the new channel members, including Norma Bags and Liddell Jones. We've had several new members who joined the channel this month, but I just want to pick a few at random and let you guys know how much I appreciate your support. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's certainly the best way you can help keep the channel afloat and help out. I'm so grateful to those of you who've decided to do that. If you want to join the channel, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link down in the description if that button isn't there. One thing I wanted to mention to you guys who stuck around until the end is I got a really weird comment on the video last week where someone suggested I was basically being a scumbag for putting ads on these videos as well as promoting channel memberships. This person claimed that I had 93,000 paid channel memberships and claimed I must be making over $100,000 a month as a result. Now, I don't normally even acknowledge comments like this, but it was so bizarre that I just wanted to bring it up and clarify we do not have 93,000 paid channel members. We have 43 paid channel members, and nearly all of you guys are subscribed to the $2 a month membership, and I'm incredibly grateful for it. When you consider that YouTube then takes almost 50% of that revenue, well, you guys can do your own math. Revenue is truly no one's business but my own, but I just had to put that out there because it was such a strange comment for someone to make. But anyway, as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.